ان الحمد لله تعالى نحمده سبحانه نستعين به ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ونبيه ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ثم اما بعد اشهد ان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي وافضل الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ونعوذ بالله تعالى من عذابه ومن النار begin by praising Allah the most high the most exalted the most honorable the most merciful our king our master our lord the most high we testify to his oneness and greatness we testify to the prophethood of his most beloved the man he sent to guide mankind until the end of times until the end of years Muhammad the son of Abdullah the son of Abdul Muttalib we ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to bless prophet Muhammad his family his community and all those who strive in his guidance until the end of time there was a uh, christian uh, the uh, monk who once was asked about what is time what is life what's the meaning of it all and he referred to a story that he learned that was about creation and when he says god we say allah and when allah azza wa jalla he first created the universe and the first creation that this monk says that god made was the dog it's not a true story i'm just uh, elaborating for the lesson inshallah god first created a dog he told the dog oh dog you will live for 20 years on earth you will your job your purpose in life is to sit on the front porch and bark at everybody that walks by the dog said oh allah oh god that's such a horrible life such a horrible purpose i don't want to live for 20 years barking at people can you cut my life in half so god said okay i'll take 10 years from your life and you'll only live for 10 years then god created the monkey and the monkey allah told it your purpose in life is to do tricks make kids laugh make people smile make people have a good time so the monkey said oh god it's a horrible life for me to live for 20 years and to only do that can you cut my life in half god said okay i'll take 10 years from your life and you'll only live for 10 then god created the cow and he told the cow oh cow your purpose in life is to from sunrise to sunset to work for your master to break your back every single day for 12 14 hours a day to serve your master give him everything that he needs all the chores all the things that he ordered you to do you will do them and you will live for 60 years on earth the cow said oh god that would be such a miserable life that's too long can you reduce my life and god said i'll take 20 years from your life and you'll live on earth for 40 years <coughs> then or live on earth for 20 years and he took 40 years. So then God created the human. Again, not a true story, but just trying to get to a lesson. God created man. And he told man, "Oh man, you can drink, eat, sleep, have fun, play, enjoy yourself and you only get to live for 20 years." The man, man said, "Oh God, that sounds like such an amazing life." but i don't only want it to be 20 years i want it to be much longer so god said okay then i have 40 years from a cow i have 10 years from the monkey and i have 10 years from the dog you can have them man said okay and that's why this christian theologian he says that life for the first 20 years of man is eating sleeping drinking playing having fun on vacations when no school is there just enjoying yourself as much as possible But then once you graduate college and you get into the real world for the next 40 years of your life every day from the moment you wake up to the moment you sleep you will serve people in your life you will serve a master whether that's your family or your children or your spouse or your husband or money or your bills or loans or banks or debts or whatever it is you're serving and working day and night for the next 40 years just to please someone else and then if you get older and you didn't kill your kids and you let them chatla live they will give you the most beautiful thing in life which is not your kids but actually grandkids grandkids are the most beautiful blessing i know for having a 
Alhamdulillah, I experienced my mom see my daughter. Is it is she loves my daughter much more than she loves me. And the blessing of having grandchildren is that you realize that at the age of 60, you will be doing all these funny tricks, silly things, silly sounds, silly games that you're playing, silly things that you're doing to your face, rolling around on the floor like a monkey for the next 10 years of your life to please your grandchildren. And then, Christian monk, not a true story, remember, it's just a, it's just a theory of how life is lived and what time means. And the last 10 years of your life, from the age of 70 to age of 80, your children will leave you. Your grandchildren won't care about you. No one will be around, so you sit on your front porch and bark at everybody that walks by. This was the theory that some people have about life. And subhanAllah, Allah Azza wa Jal, He reminds us that something much greater than that. First, He tells us people live like cattle. In whom kal an'am. Some people do truly live like dogs and cows and dogs and other animals because there's no purpose, there's no, there's no meaning to life. What is, what is the great objective of life? Most people, whether they're Muslim or not, sometimes they can live not understanding why am I on earth and why do I wake up in the morning and why should anybody care? And Allah Azza wa Jal he gives us this blessing of time, more time, a new year, a new opportunity to find out those answers. And so inshallah today, obviously the new year just came in, or a new, new calendar year. So for us to reflect over well, how, what is important about the new year, walking into this new year, how can I find out who I am better? How can I serve my life and have a more glorious life that Allah has blessed me with? And so if you will, I'm just going to give you today a double A battery, two A's. A double A battery to put into your brain, to put into your body, to put into your life, to recharge your life for this new year. Double A battery, two A's. The first A, and it is an essential important A for us to understand about our purpose in life. Why Allah just gave us the opportunity to live a new year, or to have existence, or to walk on earth. The first of them, the first A, is accountability. We are accountable. And realizing that you are accountable, that you are responsible, is the first thing on achieving a meaningful, purposeful life. And you know, subhanAllah, there was this new feature on Facebook. I didn't use it, but you know, a lot of people put it up. It's, it gives you your year in review. You press a button and it makes a video of your life on Facebook. On Instagram, they have the flipgram. You get to see your entire year on Facebook as a year in review, what you said, what pictures you took, where you went, what you ate, all this amazing stuff. But Allah Azza wa Jalla, He reminds us about a book, a lot more glorious than Facebook, a lot more advanced and technolog technologically savvy than just uh, an internet screen. Allah Azza wa Jalla, He tells us about life and a book that we will get about and share about our lives. Telling us that we're accountable. And He says, in, the, in Surah Al-Haqqa, He says, he begins by saying On the day of all days Every single one of you humans will be exposed Everything that you've ever done Will be right there in the clear Right there in front of the eyes of everyone Not just shared statuses But every word, every look, every, every deed, every action Everything you said or you thought Will be written in a book so then Allah tells us about how we can truly share a year in review or a life in review. Allah he tells us about the book that we will be given. So the one who is given his book, who will share his life, his views, his friends, his job, what he did at night, what he did in the morning, what he did when people saw, what he did when people didn't. Every status, every word, every look, every thought, every, everything about us, everything will be given. Your life book, not your Facebook. Your life book will be given to you in your right hand. فَيَقُولْ هَا Let me truly share this book with the world. Everyone get up. Look at this book. Look at this life. Look at these deeds. Look at the things that I did. Look at the amazingness 
that Allah Azzawajal blessed me to have. Look at these choices that I made. Look at these decisions that I did. Come and read them with me. Let me share them, not with the press of a button, but with looking at them, the entire world. Ha umukra'u kitabiyya. Inni dhanantu anni mulaqin hisabiyya. I always knew. Every day I woke up and every day I went to sleep. Every new year that came, new month, new week, new day. Every single moment of my life, I knew that I would stand here. Just like you see me and I see you, that I would stand in front of Allah and He would see me and I would be held accountable for every single thing that I ever did. I knew, I knew this day would come, I was ready, I prepared, I made the right choices. فَهُوَ فِي عِيشَةٍ رَاضِيَةٍ So he will be in. He is not a part of a nice life. He is the main actor of a life of bliss and pleasure, whatever, however, in whatever way he wanted or she wanted, you will be the main character of an eternal movie script until the end of time. فَهُوَ فِي عِيشَةٍ رَاضِيَةٍ فِي جَنَّةٍ عَالِيَةٍ قُطُوفُهَا دَانِيَةً كُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا هَنِيئًا It's your life. It's your blessing. It's your eternal bliss. You got the book in your right hand. Your life was perfect. You shared it with the world and you will live the most magnificent life for eternity without death whichever way you want. But some people don't make the right choices. They don't share the proper things on Facebook or Instagram. They don't go to the right places, hang out with the right people, say the right things, think the right way, do the right things. And so, it's all about choices. It's all about accountability. It's all about understanding that we are accountable for everything that we've done. So some people make the wrong decisions and their book is shared with them as well. Their life book is shared. But it's in their left hand. And they will be told, فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِي فَسَوْفَ يُحَاسَبُ حِسَابًا يَسِرًا فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِشِمَالِهِ فَيَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أُوْتَ كِتَابِيَ For the one who is given his book in his left hand, he will be told, he will say, he will scream out, I wish that this book of life was never given to me. I wish this was not my life. I wish was, this was not my days, my months, my years, my calendar when I was 22, when I was 35, when I was 65. I wish this wasn't me. يا ليتها كانت القاضية I wish that my life never existed. It was never there. I wish that I just died. So I wouldn't see it. So I wouldn't be held responsible for it. So I wouldn't be accountable for it. And he says that I never expected, I never thought that I would stand one day and have to share this with the world. I never expected to be held accountable. I never thought that my life would have to be standing in front of Allah. And I never expected accountability. I didn't think there was any purpose to life. And so he will be responsible. And Allah Azza will say, خُذُوهُ فَغُلُّوا ثُمَّ الْجَحِيمَ صَلُّوا ثُمَّ فِي سِلْسِلَةٍ ضَرْعُهَا سَبْعُونَ ذِرَاعَ فَاسْلُكُوا Take him to the utter worst torment possible. Because he was responsible. She was responsible. But they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Accountability. My brothers and sisters, we are accountable. We are beings. We are different than animals because we have an intellect. We have a mind. We have a purpose. We have objectives in life. And the most important objective is that we are responsible to our maker and our creator and our master once our lives come to an end. We are responsible every day, week, every new year from 2015 until 2090. We are responsible for everything that we do in life. And that's why Umar has a beautiful reminder. He says, Oh people, hold yourselves accountable. Hold yourselves accountable before you are held accountable. Wazinu amalakum and hold your deeds. Scale and weigh and hold your deeds down before they are weighed against you, before they are held against you. Be accountable people. Understand that in our life, every new year that comes, it's not a year of new fun or new happiness, of course, 
but it's another year of being accountable, another page in our book that we either get in our right or left. So how will we write our story? We are the authors, and we are the directors, and we are the producers. But it's how we live our life that we are accountable for it. Number one, the new year should remind us of accountability. That we are accountable for every day that we get. Number one, the first A. The second A, inshallah ta'ala, before we end this first part of the khutbah, the second A is a very, very important A as well. Accountable beings, but there should be something very important in our future. Not just looking in the rear view mirror all the time but looking out the windshield far in advance and it's an important A for the new year and it's the A of ambition being ambitious wanting more doing more seeking more dreaming of more and it starts by a simple hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. It's the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ for a new year, a new time, a new start, a new change that we think about. What did the Prophet ﷺ tell us about time and the future that we have and the blessings that we have? He says ﷺ about the eternal blessing, about Jannah. Being ambitious, wanting more in life. Allah Azzawajal, the Prophet ﷺ tells us in Al-Bukhari about a beautiful hadith about Jannah. Allah Azzawajal, he says uh, ﷺ, he says that inna fil jannah Jannah has 100 levels Ma bayna darajain What is between two levels Is between us and the closest star If not further Between 100 levels of paradise From one level, from one floor to the next floor Is from us to the closest star Or the furthest star Huge distance between them but if you truly want Jannah and you ask Allah for Jannah, don't ask. If you were me, I just want a studio apartment, one bedroom in the middle of the projects. No problem. I'll go to Jannah there. That's my Jannah. That's fine. Let me in. But the Prophet is more ambitious and teaching us to be more ambitious. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ask him for the this firdaus that's really high in Jannah. فَإِنَّهُ It is from the middle of Jannah إِلَىٰ أَعْلَىٰ To the highest part of Jannah. وَفَوْقَهُ عَرْشُ الرَّحْمَةِ Right above it is the throne of the Most Merciful. So don't ask for Jannah. Just a corner or a studio or a shack in Jannah. But ask for the highest level of Jannah. Teaching us about ambition. And Chaw Ta'ala in the second part of the khutbah, we'll talk about some stories of how ambition is an essential part of our new year. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu salam ala rasulullah, nashadu an la ilaha illallah, nashadu anna muhammad rasulullah, Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala nabina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim tasliman kathira thumma ma ba'd. Ambition, the second A for today. Ambition is something that was taught by the Prophet sallam of course, but it was integrated into the minds and the hearts of his teach, of his students, his companions. They all, every single one of them, had a particular ambition. And they always wanted, they always strove for that ambition. And I give you the story of being ambitious, just the fact of us not being as ambitious as we should be. The story of one of the lowest, if you will, one of the lowest of the lows in the society of the Prophet ﷺ. His name was Rabi bin Kaab. He was from Ahl al-Sufa, he lived in the masjid. He was in the shelter, the masjid was a shelter, and he lived. No money, no home, no wife, no family. He didn't have anything. He was as poor as poor can come. And so one day he's sitting with the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ is taking questions out from people and people are asking him for things and he's trying his best to answer all of them. And so he saw, the Prophet ﷺ saw this young man, he's a teen maybe in his early 20s, his name is Rabi'i and he asked him, you know what Ya Rabi'i, why don't you ask me something? What is it that you want? What is it that you're trying to be ambitious for? So he thought and he thought, and he thought and he thought, and this young man, he told words to the Prophet ﷺ that he didn't understand how a young man could say such amazing words. He said, Ya Rasulullah, all I ask for, if you can grant it to me, is 
مُرَافَكَتُكَ فِي الْجَنَّةِ I want to be with you in the summit of Jannah. Young man. Prophet almost didn't understand. Did Umar tell you this? Did Abu Bakr tell you this? You are, you are, you are asking me for this? Who told you to say this? No? Ya Rasulullah, I thought of all the great things I can have in life. A wife, a house, a car, amazing money, a huge business, a being a, a leader of an co- entire country. I thought of everything that I can have. And then I said to myself, well, that's all going to go away eventually. And then I thought of eternity, Jannah. And then I thought of what would be the best place in Jannah to be in. And I thought, I just want to be with you in the highest parts of Jannah. Ambition. Ambition. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he was told about eight gates of paradise. Again, maybe we'd like, oh man, just, just get me through the side door. Oh, cut the fence open and I'll sneak into Jannah. Any way I can get in, I'll get in. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he says, Ya Rasulullah, there's eight gates of Jannah? Yeah. Every single person will enter through one of them. He said, Ya Rasulullah, can anybody enter through eight of them? He said, yes. And you will be of them, Ya Abu Bakr. Ambition. Ambition is extremely important. Wanting great things, striving and having that great goal in front of you. Always be ambitious in your life. But not only in, of course, hereafter. The most important thing. But Allah Azza wa didn't tell us to say, Allahumma atina fi dunya wal akhirati hasana. Allah Azza wa told us to say, Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana. Wa fil akhirati hasana. Do and excel in this life. And then do and excel and want the best in the next life. So in this life, if you learn, if we go over the story of the Prophet ﷺ, how does he teach us to be great? How does he teach us to be ambitious in this life? And I will end with these two stories in Ta'ala about wanting great things in this life before the next life. First of them is the actual new year. Alhamdulillah, the calendar year, the Gregorian calendar is nice. It's a new year. But the actual new year starts with the migration of the Prophet ﷺ. And the story of the migration tells us about how ambitious the Prophet ﷺ actually was. May Allah Azza wa have peace and blessings upon him. In the time of his birth, in the time that he came to earth, for us as a blessing, he reminds us in his story of the true new year, how ambitious we should all be. It was the 13th year of the Prophet's life, after he became a prophet, he essentially was thrown out of his own home, he's running away as a fugitive, no money, no business, family ran away, a few of his friends are already in Medina, he owns nothing of world or materialism. He has nothing in his possession. He is running away and Mecca put 100 camels, let's say 100 million dollars, as a bounty on his head. He's the most wanted man on earth. And he is running away with Abu Bakr, and he doesn't go north to Medina, he comes south and along the coast. The Meccans, they send out all the people to go find him. They send out the best of them, one of their best trackers in the desert. His name is Suraqa bin Malik. Suraqa bin Malik goes out and as the Prophet is, takes a different route, Suraqa bin Malik is the only man from the Meccans or from the, tri- from the people that were sent out that found the Prophet He found him, he caught up to him and he stood in front of him. And then the Prophet told him, Suraqa was a Bedouin, he didn't, wasn't, he was a great, and now it was a navigation system of the desert. GPS, forget about Gavin. But he went and he found the Prophet and he says, Ya Rasulullah, you're coming. Oh Muhammad, you're coming with me. A hundred million dollars, I just hit the lottery. The Prophet tells him, wait. Would you let me go if I gave you a promise? Ambition of the Prophet said, ambition. A man that owns nothing is running away as a fugitive. Ya Rasulullah, Oh, 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 Suraka, would you be willing to, for me to make you a promise? He says, go ahead. He said, what if I guaranteed you that if you let me go and my companions go, that I would promise you the armor of the king of the most, second most powerful civilization on earth of Persia? What if I promised you the armor of the Persian king? What ambition, Ya Rasulullah? You have nothing. You, you, you're running, you don't even have a home right now. You don't have a building where you can sleep in at night. But he is promising with his ambition, the civilization of the most dominant entity on earth. 
the king, just like promising the Rolex on Obama's wrist. It's crazy. Surah bin Malik, he knows he never told a lie. So he says, Ya Rasulullah, you know, he doesn't say Ya Rasulullah, but he says, Oh Muhammad, okay, but write it down for me as an agreement. Write it down in the contract. Writes it down 10 years later in the Khilafah of Umar anhu, after the Persians opened and the Ghanaim and the booties of war came flooding into Medina, Umar calls Suraka and puts the armors of Persia in his lap as he cries and they cry. Ambition. Have ambition. Want great things. It's the sin of the Prophet. If we want to celebrate the birth of Muhammad Sallallahu adopt his sunnah, live his life as he wanted us to live, have these amazing lessons from his life that he wants us to live with our life. And I'll end inshallah ta'ala, I know we have some days off, so I'll take five more minutes inshallah ta'ala. We can say, oh, these are companions. That's a messenger. These are people that are great and they wear capes and they're super people. What about me? What about someone that's normal, that's average, that's ordinary? And wallahi, it's, it's one of the most beautiful stories I learned from one of my, one of the people I love studying with, Imam Sheikh Sahib Wab. He said that there were once upon a time, a young man who was a normal person, not a companion, not a sahabi, not a tabi, he's a normal man. Lived in Muslim Spain in Andalus. Young man, he was working as a donkey man. He was a donkey man. A donkey man is a man that has a donkey and it's like a supermarket on a donkey. He has some vegetables, some fruits, some apples, some tomatoes, and he carries the donkey, and he walks through the streets selling them. So, he meets up with some of his friends that are also donkey men. So he's sitting with, there's just four of them, he's sitting with the three others, and he's like, man, what, what kind of miserable life are we living? Oh, we are, we're donkey men. Our fathers were donkey men. Their fathers were donkey men. All we ever do is be donkey men. When will we make a change in our life? His friends said, come on, man, be quiet. Forget, come on, stop. We're donkey, that's our destiny. Khalas, qadar Allah. So he says, you know what? I'm quitting. I'm going to make a change. I want to be the king of Al-Andalus. The Khalifa of Al-Andalus. That's what I want to be. They started laughing at him and like, come on. He's like, no, seriously, I'm going to be the Khalifa of Al-Andalus. If I became the Khalifa, what would you guys want from me? So I said, okay, let's imagine. They said, let's imagine it. So the first man said, you know what? If you became the Khalifa of Al-Andalus, I want huge acres of gardens. Give me huge acres of gardens. I could build a business and sell and live and have beautiful life. He said, okay. Second friend, he looked at him and said, listen, if I became Khalifa, what do you want? He said, give me stables of horses. I love horses like race cars. I would love like a garage of Ferraris and Lamborghinis. I want a stable of horses. Give me horses. He said, okay. Third man, hey, what would you want if I became the Khalifa of Al-Andalus? His friend looks at him and he says, if you... His name is Muhammad bin Amr al-Mansuri. If you, Muhammad, became the Khalifa of Al-Andalus, I want you to tie my hands, put me on my donkey, push me through the streets, have the people throw these vegetables at me, and I will tell them what kind of stupid people would have this man as their Khalifa. So, <coughs> Muhammad bin Amr enters the police force. He leaves his job and he becomes a policeman. After many years working hard, being just, being good, he becomes a lieutenant. He moves on up, he becomes the chief. He moves on up, he becomes the chief of police in Qurtuba, the capital of Al-Andalus. He gets on up a little bit and then he becomes the defense minister of Al-Andalus. The Khalifa dies, his son dies. And all of a sudden, Muhammad bin Amr al-Mansuri is pushed to be the Khalifa of Al-Andalus after years of hard work. He walks and goes back to his old town in Spain, Muslim Spain. And he tells his guards, go to this place and this sitting. My friends, they're still there. Go and bring them. So they go and they walk into the masjid and they see Muhammad bin Hamr, the Khalifa of Al-Andalus. So he brings them and says, come sit, sit, sit. My friends, come sit. You guys remember that time? Years ago when we were sitting together, and I told you if I become the Khalifa, what would I give you? Well, today I'm going to give it to you. So he tells the first man, hey, do you remember what you asked for? He said, yeah. I said, if you became the Khalifa, I want you to give me gardens, acres of gardens to have my own business. He said, he tells his guards, give him acres of gardens. Second man, he's like, hey, do you remember what you asked me for? He said, yeah. 
I said, if you became the Khalifa, I want stables of horses that I can race and breed them and enjoy them. He's like, tells his guards, give it to him. Third man, he's like, hey, do you remember what you told me? He's like, nah, man, what are you, what are you talking about? I don't remember that day. What are, you, what are you saying? Like, I told you, you told me that if I became the Khalifa, that I should tie you up on your donkey, send you through the streets, and have the people throw vegetables at you, while you said, what kind of idiot would make Muhammad bin Amr the Khalifa of Al-Andalus? What kind of people, what kind of idiots? Then he tells his guards, do it to him. But don't tell them what kind of idiot. Tell them, Inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. Allah can do anything as he wants. It was this ambition that many great people, they have great objectives in their lives, great things that they want to achieve, great goals that they have, dreams that they have. It takes a lot of hard work and dedication. That's maybe another khutbah. But the fact that we don't have enough youngsters, old people, that w young, young or older, women or men that want to be great, they want to do great things. They want to say, man, I want to be the mayor of this city. I want to be the best journalist in, in, in the world. I want to start this organization. I want to work for this cause. Wallahi, no one, no one. Allah has created us so that we all have something special inside ourselves to drive ourselves. No one can help us find it. It's self-driven. The greatest goals are your, in your life are goals that you want. And so some lessons before we close. Number one, two A's. We said accountability and ambition. Number one, as individuals, we should always hold ourselves very accountable. Be very accountable on yourself more than anybody else. Don't always look through, through the mirror. Don't always look out the window at others. Look in the mirror at yourself and hold yourself accountable. Where are you with your relationship with Allah? Where are you with your relationship with your parents, in your job, in your school, in your education, in your life, in your goals, in your ambitions? Hold yourself accountable, first and foremost. Number two, as individuals, we should not be shy to make crazy goals, to have crazy ambitions, to want it was the nature, and I can give you a hundred more stories of companions and tabi'een and great men and women, whether they're Muslim or not, that have great ambitions and they work really hard every day of their life to get to those goals, and they are not fabricated. So parents, even though I love and respect you, you can't tell your child his goals and ambitions. Children, you have to honor and respect and, and be good to your parents, but you have to have this innate goal from within you. No one can teach it to you, no one can tell you, no one can direct you, it's from within you. So find out what it is that you're great at, what you want to do and do it. And as families, we should never kill the ambitions of a son or daughter. You want to buy a car, go ahead, go buy it. You're going to do it with your own money, you're going to find a job and you're going to, you're going to lease the finance yourself, you're going to pay the insurance, it's all on you, go ahead. As long as it's a good value, something that's good, let them do it. Let them have their own goals. I don't want to be a doctor, I want to be a journalist. Sounds crazy in a Muslim household. Arab or Desi, you would get killed. You'd get hung upside down from your feet. But that's my goal, that's my ambition. I want to free Palestine. I want to work for the people in Somalia. I want to end world hunger or AIDS or cancer. Have these ambitions. Good, go and do it. Go ahead. Give people the opportunity. As families, we should support one another. If your wife comes and tells you, I want to open up my own business, don't kill her dreams. If your husband wants to tell you, I want to go and memorize the Quran, don't tell him you're a lazy bum. I know you'll never memorize the Quran. We should be very supportive of one another as families, as parents, as sons, as daughters, as brothers and sisters. When you hear somebody's goals in your family, support one another, care, try to help one another. Don't kill ambition in our community. Don't kill ambition in your families. Don't kill ambition in your hearts and your minds. It is an essential ingredient for reviving our ummah. I ask Allah Azza wa to make us be of those that always hold ourselves accountable. Ask Allah Azza wa to forgive us of our mistakes and our shortcomings from 2014 and to allow 2015 to be a rejuvenated iman for him Jalla fi ula. Ask Allah Azza wa to allow our children to be the leaders of tomorrow, to allow our men and women, young men and women to be the leaders of tomorrow. We ask Allah Azza wa to make our fathers the best fathers and our mothers the best mothers and our, our men the best business owners and our women the best business owners and to give success and excellence in everybody and all their, and, and, and all their ambitions. 
We ask Allah Azza to give us Al Firdaus Al A'la Min Al Jannah. We ask Allah Azza to give us the highest levels of Jannah, to be with the Prophet and his companions, to be with our brothers and sisters of those that came before us, that gave us our guidance. In Allah Ya'mur Bil Adli Wal Ihsan Wa Ita'i Dil Qurba Wa Yanha An Al Fahshai Wal Munkar Wal Baghi. Ya'idukum La'allakum Tadakkarun. Uthkuru Allah Yathkurukum. Wa Shkuru Wa La Takfuru Wa Aqin Al Salah. Before I, 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 before we have the Salah, I apologize. Just a couple of announcements. Number one, the first of them is uh, to out every Friday night we have family night. So please join us tonight at 7.30 for family night. We have a very special program that we're starting Saturdays, starting tomorrow at 5.30 after Salat al-Maghrib for youth, those ages 14 to 25. It's a special educational course in Ta'ala program that we'll be having every Saturday. So we highly encourage if your children want to come or your friends or those that you know, a very unique in Ta'ala weekly uh, course or weekly uh, uh, program for youth in Ta'ala here in the center. And the last of them is a reminder that on January 31st is the fundraiser for the Mass Islamic Center of Dallas. We highly encourage you to all not only attend but to buy tickets and to help support this center inshallah ta'ala working on the development of the next generation. Barakallahu feekum. Wa akum as-salam.